So a little while back, I asked you guys on here and on Twitter about how you felt about the new film, The Green Knight, directed by David Lowry. And boy was it polarized. But specifically between the I love it and uh, camps, and that's great. There's a lot to love about The Green Knight. There's a lot I loved about it. The visuals were stunning, and Dev Patel is cool, and I love a good talking fox. But um... Today, I want to discuss how this movie relates to his source material, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, and then take you on a brief and absolutely non-exhaustive journey through how it relates to medieval queerness. So as usual, some disclaimers. This will not cover all of medieval history. This will also not cover every single aspect of the movie or poem. I am not telling you how to feel about this movie, and yes, this armor is super effing hot, and I will not wear it for all of the video. So enjoy it while it lasts. And lastly, huge spoilers spoiler warning for the Green Knight movie, as well as its centuries-old source material. But before we get into our nightly quest to learn some history, let's hear a bit about today's sponsor, Blinkist. There are so many books on my to-read list, but unfortunately I'm a terminally busy person and rarely have time to read for fun. That's why I love using Blinkist, because I can get the major points of a book in a short amount of time by listening to their audio summaries of thousands of books in various genres. Each summary runs around 10 to 15 minutes and I can listen to them while driving, working on illustrations or my comic, or just in the downtime that I do have before bed. It also helps me figure out what books I want to prioritize and read in full, because I've gotten a look at what they have to offer and if they're actually worth the time or money. I found so many new books through Blinkist, like Why We Don't Learn From History by B.H. Little Hart, How To Do Nothing by Jenny O'Dell, and Napoleon's Buttons by Penny Lacoute and Jay Burrison. It's also great that the Blinks have text summaries so that I can quick reference them again when I need to. Now Blinkist is even branching into summarizing podcast episodes for their new shortcasts, so definitely check that out. The first 100 people to go to the link in the description or the pinned comment are going to get unlimited access for one week to try it out. You'll also get 25% off if you want the full membership. The seven-day trial is completely free, and you can cancel at any time during the trial period. So thank you so much to Blinkist for sponsoring this video, and now, time to learn more about Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. So if you went into watching The Green Knight without knowing anything about the source material, you were probably super confused. And if you did know the source material, well, according to the polls, you also were kind of confused. The reason being, David Lowry made a lot of changes for the movie, and we'll go over those. But before we get there, I think we need to start at the very beginning and hear a brief summary of the original story of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, written in the Cotton Nero manuscript, most likely around the year 1400, by an anonymous poet. The story begins in King Arthur's court at Christmas time, which extended to New Year's back then. Arthur has a tradition where he doesn't eat until somebody tells him a cool story of adventure. But before a story could be told, an outrageously sexy knight all clad in green busts through the door on his horse. He is so very big and so very sexy, but he's also completely green. Like, even his body is green, so Arthur, understandably, is like, Hey, what the fuck? You would not believe how hot and sexy this Green Knight was. I, the anonymous poet, describe just how hot and sexy he is for two whole pages. The knight says to the crowd, Hey guys, uh, <clears throat> I want to play a game. One of y'all can take my super cool axe and deliver me a strike with it. And then one year from now, you have to meet me at my place and I get to strike you back the exact same way. And, um... You get to keep my cool axe in the meantime, so to be honest, I think it's a pretty good deal. Nobody volunteered. So Arthur's about to take up the offer himself when Sir Gawain, Arthur's nephew, comes forth to take the challenge instead. He takes the Green Knight's axe, and the knight kneels before him, bearing his super sexy neck. And Gawain just goes and chops his head right off. But then the Green Knight picks his head up and gets back on his horse and says, in one year, come meet me in the Green Chapel so I can return the blow. Everyone has a big laugh over this and gets back to partying. And Gawain kind of forgets about the whole thing until the following Michaelmas when he remembers, oh crap, I'm gonna get my head imminently chopped off. And so he gets into his armor and rides off on his long journey. He fights some snakes, he fights some wolves, he fights some people who live in caves for some reason, he fights some bears and boars. By Christmas Eve, he finally finds himself at a huge castle and decides to stay there. The suspiciously sexy lord of the castle welcomes him, and Gawain celebrates the early days of Christmas there. He tells the lord, Lord Bertilak, of his quest, and Lord Bertilak says, Oh, the Green Chapel? What a coincidence, it's literally only two miles from here. You're early. So while you hang out here, why don't we play a game? 
a game. Wow, that sounds familiar. The game is that every morning, Lord Bertilak will go out hunting and give Gawain whatever he catches that day, while Gawain spends the day hanging out with Lord Bertilak's wife. At the end of the day, Gawain must give Bertilak anything he's taken or been given. A game of exchanges. Simple enough. Gawain agrees to this suspiciously sexy lord. They have a good party that night and get along famously. And so, Bertilak goes out hunting that first day. Back at the castle, Gawain rests and Lady Bertilak busts into his room. Gawain pretends to be asleep and then realizes this makes him look like a wuss and so he gets up. Lady Bertilak tries to seduce him, but Gawain politely refuses and all she gets out of him is one kiss. When Lord Bertilak returns that night, he gives Gawain the winnings of the hunt and Gawain throws his arm around the lord's neck and kisses him. Good night. The next day, Bertilak hunts again and Lady Bertilak tries to stews Gawain again and he once again dodges her advances, but they kiss two times. And so, when Bertilak comes back with the winnings of the hunt, Gawain takes him around the neck and kisses him a second time. Finally, on the third day, a third hunt. Lady Bertilak comes again and kisses Gawain twice, but again, gains nothing further. So this time, she gifts him with the green girdle from her waist, claiming that it will protect him from harm so long as he wears it. And Gawain's like, sick. She kisses him a third time, and then she leaves. When Lord Bertilak returns from the hunt, this time he returns Gawain a fox. Gawain kisses him three times, I quote, with much gusto, but he doesn't tell Bertilak about the green girdle. The next morning is New Year's Day, and he bids the unusually sexy couple farewell. Off to the green chapel. There, the green knight appears. Hey Gawain, time to chop off your head. Begrudgingly, Gawain kneels. But as the green knight raises his axe, Gawain flinches. What the hell, dude? When you chopped my head off, I wasn't a baby about it. Well, I can't put my head back on my body once it's off like you can, says Gawain. So the Green Knight raises his axe again and brings it down and only leaves a little cut on the back of Gawain's neck. See, I've given you a strike in return, Gawain, as promised, the Green Knight says. And guess what? It's me, Lord Bertilak. It was me all along. You kept your promise to me at my castle, but you didn't tell me about my wife giving you the magic girl. So, like, you did lose the game. And I was behind it all along. I told my wife to try and woo you and give you the girdle, LMAO. Gawain is super embarrassed, takes off the girdle and confesses his wrongdoing, which pleases the knight. He lets Gawain keep the girdle as a token of his journey. Then the Green Knight reveals that actually it was Morgan Le Fay behind this all along. And Morgan was trying to test the virtue of King Arthur's court and have all kinds of girl boss throwdowns with Guinevere or something. I don't know, Morgan Le Fay is always up to some shenanigans. The Green Knight invites Gawain to a New Year's party, but Gawain refuses, kisses him goodbye, and leaves for home. Back at Camelot, Gawain tells his story, shame and all, and everyone at the court supports him and they all wear a green girdle to honor him. The end. Pretty different from the movie, right? Sir Gawain and the Green Knight is a pretty lighthearted story of romance and virtue with a lot of various themes. In this video, I'm going to cover one of the main themes that I've chosen, queerness. And we'll look at how the poem covers it and how the movie chose to adapt it. Right off the bat, the Green Knight movie clearly wants to distance itself from its own source material in a way. I have no doubt that David Lowry loves this story. He said that during college it was one of his favorites, and I can definitely see a lot of love for the poem in the film itself. But at the same time, Lowry also makes a lot of changes that I personally feel are a bit antithetical to the poem's meanings, largely the choice to make a major theme of the movie about cowardice rather than about keeping your word and honesty. Gawain is introduced as a slow-to-start, careless type with commitment issues towards his randomly inserted girlfriend, who is not a character in the original poem. Lowry said in an interview that he changed this, as well as making Morgan Le Fay Gawain's mother, in order to have the quest itself operate as a means of Morgan giving Gawain a kick in the butt that he needs to make something of his life. Reflecting Lowry's relationship with his own mother, because he feels bad that he lived at home for too long or something? Anyway, furthermore, this Gawain is not yet a knight, so his quest is a vehicle for his attaining knighthood despite the fact that he's doomed to die at the end. And yeah, he dies at the end, because he's no longer a coward, so he faces death. So here's where I hit an issue in the theater while watching this movie. I actually enjoyed it. I was loving the vibes. The production was beautiful, Dev Patel is great as usual, the costumes were nice, the fox talked, that was cool, loved the music, but that's just it. I liked everything about it that didn't make it Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. If I watch this movie pretending it's just a surrealist dramatic medieval movie, I have a great time. But if I go into it thinking about the original poem, then I come away confused and frustrated. 
confused not because I don't understand what the movie's trying to say. I went to conceptual art school, I have seen and made far weirder and harder to digest works, but because many of the changes made to the movie feel almost resentful of its original themes. One thing that I think the movie actually handled well is the theme of magic and nature and the medieval anxiety surrounding pagan cultural roots. The Green Knight, of course, is a symbolic allegory for the Celtic Green Man. But this video isn't about that, as interesting as it is. I'm going to address a theme that I think the movie handled pretty poorly. Queerness. In the original poem, as we saw, Lord Bertilac and Gawain play a game that results in Gawain kissing Bertilac numerous times with great enthusiasm. And I'm gonna say something that might be a little controversial. I don't think it actually is useful to debate if this was intended by the Gawain poet to be gay or not. Because guess what? We will never know. I mean, I'm going to get into it because I love analyzing things, but still, we don't actually know a lot about the Gawain poet. And we have good guesses as where and when they lived, and some theories as to the circumstances of the creation of the manuscript, but beyond that, parsing out the true meaning behind the themes in Sir Gawain and the Green Knight is forever going to be a scholarly debate. So my take on it is that it just doesn't really matter. The fact is that this story has held cultural significance for queer people for a long, long time, because they see themselves reflected in it. And that's the very clear historical and cultural context that David Lowry is interacting with when he makes his adaptational decisions. And I think he beefed this one. Because in The Green Knight, this light-hearted game of seduction and man-to-man -man kisses is reduced to a scene where Lady Bertilac actually gets something out of Gawain, and Lord Bertilac forces a kiss upon Gawain, who is then disgusted and leaves. Why, David? Why did you do that? I've read numerous interviews and reviews, and he seems to be avoiding explaining himself. Explain it, David. So the movie replaces homoeroticism with a weird, gay, panicky scene of predatoriness. If Sir Gawain and the Green Knight didn't already have a very strong and famous queer subtext, intended or not, Lowry wouldn't have had anything to work with in order to make it that. But regardless of what the poet intended with regards to the homoeroticism, what we do know is what they did mean the game to be a test of Gawain's truthfulness. Can he keep his word? Is he honest and true? In the end, yes and no. He kept his word by returning the kisses he gained from the lady to the lord, but by hiding the gift of the green girdle, he didn't keep his word. A lie by omission. And he regains this virtue later in the green chapel by confessing his wrongdoing. It's a very Christian ending. Confessing a sin in a holy place and being forgiven by a being higher than yourself. You know what's a funny through line I always see in critique of queer readings of, well, most things? The claim that if something isn't explicitly about sex, it can't be in good faith read as queer. Reducing the queer experience down to the thin line of sex as if there's nothing else there. Never mind the erasure of gay and bi asexual people here and more beyond that. Any LGBTQ person at all, if you bothered to talk to any, can tell you that the experience is far more complex than simple sexual attraction. That's why the LGBTQ community is always making jokes about, like, inanimate objects being gay or having a gender that they want to steal or things like that. This reductionist idea of what queerness can be is willfully ignorant at best. If you're looking at history and thinking, well, you can't say for certain any of these people are gay, they never said so. Well, yeah, no shit. When we look at history in search of LGBTQ history, we're usually looking for it in two different ways. The version where we search for queerness in the terms and context as it would have existed in history, and the version where we search for instances in history that reflect what we today view to be queer, therefore finding a reflection of ourselves in the past. Because what is considered queer today wasn't necessarily considered queer in the past, and maybe it was considered queer in a different way. Things we consider normal and not queer at all today sometimes were themselves considered strange or otherwise queer in their own historical context. It's all completely relative, and so we have to look at history from multiple points of view. The view where we build an understanding of historical context, and then the view where we can say, hey, this thing in history feels queer by modern standards, and I see myself reflected in it and gain value from that. You can do both without also assigning anachronistic meaning to history where it may not exactly fit. 
because maybe it meant something else. The words we have to describe LGBTQ identities today were only developed in the years following the late Victorian era, but just because modern specific identities weren't a thing back then, doesn't mean that queerness as we understand it today didn't ever exist or that they didn't have their own version of it within their own context. Because when we as modern people look back at history in search of our collective queer history, what we're really doing is searching for the existence of actions, relationships, and lives that materially reflect what is labeled as queer today. Saying things like, well, men were just more touchy in friendships back then, or spoke to each other romantically, or kissed, that doesn't make them gay. Duh. <laughs> but what's important is it's queer to us, and the fundamental benefit of pointing these things out and re-examining them in a queer lens is to recognize the malleability of our own societal constructs. You may look at my life, my gayness, my transness, and say it's not normal, it's wrong, and I can point at history and say at its core, it wasn't always necessarily considered that way. It deconstructs our present, not the past. It allows us to call into question what we today hold to be natural truths. So people in the medieval era never called themselves gay or trans because they didn't have those words. And some extremely dense people use that as a green light to assume a lack of medieval queerness. But honestly, if we today see actions or lifestyles that reflect modern queerness, well, Boom, it's queer history. Because even if the historical context and understanding are different, the instance or state of being itself is a predecessor of our modern queer experience, which is queer. And that's why the seduction game in The Green Knight has held such significance for gay people for so long. Regardless of if it was considered explicitly gay in its own time, that is how it has been come to understood through the ages. It's an extremely important part of the story. It takes up a bulk of the word count after all. So to remove it almost entirely from the movie and instead only include the homoerotic kisses between Gawain and Bertilak in only one scene, which has now been changed to make Bertilak honestly predatory and make Gawain disgusted by it, Mm, I don't like it. I think it wasn't a wise choice. Of course, my opinion is at odds with a lot of reviews praising Lowry for cutting out most of the Bertilak scenes, saying that it was a waste of time and likened it to Peter Jackson leaving Tom Bombadil out of Lord of the Rings. First of all, keep your Tom Bombadil slander away from me. This is a sacred Tommy Tom respecting space. Secondly, takes like this are weird to me, because obviously scenes that take up that much space in the story must be, uh, I don't know, symbolically and thematically important? No? Okay. And you know what's interesting? Whether the director is aware of it or not, even though the homoeroticism was made weirdly homophobic, the heterosexual scenes in the story were changed in such a way that makes them just as bad by actual medieval standards. Because this may come as a shock to some of you, certainly came as a shock to me, but that scene with the girdle? That counts as sodomy. Our common modern understanding of sodomy is very different from what it was in the medieval era. Bigots today claim it only applies to a specific action between cis gay men. You know the one. Sometimes it's any butt stuff. But the truth is that in the Middle Ages, sodomy was literally any sexual act that was not literally PIV between a married couple with the intent of conceiving a child. That's right, literally every sexual act that doesn't cover all of the above factors was sodomy. So heterosexual couples having unmarried sex or a married couple doing non-PIV things were just as liable to pay a fine or do penance as two men or two women or anyone caught doing solo acts. Seriously. It was all basically on the same level. This mythical fantasy history that bigots believe in of a pure heterosexual yesteryear where gay people were the only ones sexually persecuted because they're the only ones sinning is literally false. Although I've been told by some people that went to Catholic school that Catholicism still abides by this older definition of sodomy. Not that I would know. You are a sodomite and you are a sodomite and you are a sodomite. <laughs> Even further, the girdle itself is often used in medieval texts as a symbol for sodomy. But anyway, that's why this scene is incredibly funny. By medieval standards, what happens between Lady Bertilak and Gawain is sodomy, and vastly more of a sin than whatever Lord Bertilak and Gawain were up to. Which I guess is fine for the point the director was trying to make. Whatever that was. I need to get out of my armor. I am sweating. It's so hot. Oh my god. Did you know that LA summer is really hot? <laughs> I don't 
don't know why I'm doing this to myself. Okay, there's also the very lengthy descriptions of the Green Knight's powerful appearance. Some people discount homoerotic readings of this as like, the poet was just describing how big and powerful he was to make him intimidating. Yeah, for almost two entire pages. <laughs> And his big loins and lovely neck get described in great detail too. I'm sure that contributes a lot to describing his power and not just how hot he is. But I digress and return to my point from before. It's less important to argue whether the poet intended this to be a homoerotic reading because we'll never know what they truly intended. All we have are our own readings of it. All readers do. And so there's no one true reading. Whatever you get out of this poem, that's your reading, and that's just as valid as anyone else's. But the fact is, many, many people for hundreds of years have gotten homoerotic readings from this poem. And that doesn't just come from nowhere. It means the poem holds a great historical importance for queer people, not because it may or may not have been intended to be queer when it was written, but because of what it means to the people who read it, because that's what it gives off. And for any historical works that reflect what is today a queer experience, that's all we have. And But what about actual medieval queerness, you may be asking? How does the story Sir Gawain and the Green Knight enact queerness in its era's own terms. Well, as usual, a lot of this is connected to the constructs of gender themselves. In my video on women with short hair, I talked a bit about the Victorian era's idea that failing to properly present oneself according to your assigned gender's rules can sometimes effectively ungender you entirely. Something similar can be said for the Middle Ages. In Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, medieval readers will have been well aware of the story displaying open masculinization and demasculinization of Sir Gawain. Gawain is first masculinized by his establishment as a knight and his courageous approach to the Green Knight's game, and textually in the scene describing him being dressed in armor. But the minute Gawain becomes a guest at Bertilak's castle, the text tone around him shifts completely. While the men of the house rise early to hunt, Gawain femininely sleeps in and is then hunted himself, sexually, by Lady Bertilak, pretending to be asleep when she enters. These things don't read as demasculinization to the modern reader, but to the medieval sensibilities, this is clearly placing Gawain in the feminine role during the game rejecting the beautiful lady's advances, but delivering enthusiastic kisses to the stronger man, Lord Bertilak. Meanwhile, it's the women of the story who flip and adopt the masculine roles. Lady Bertilak is the pursuer, the dominant one in the exchange. And by far extension, Morgan Le Fay is the most dominant one of all, orchestrating everything from the shadows and having Lord Bertilak assist her plan. By medieval standards, it's a clear display of gender play because so much of gender at the time was hinged on actions and how one acts with and around the opposite sex. The tension here comes back during Gawain's final encounter with the Green Knight in the Green Chapel, when his emasculation by Lady Bertilak is revealed by the Green Knight. Gawain attempts to reclaim his masculinity by going on a bizarre misogynistic tirade, claiming that the lady was actually acting as some kind of Eve-like temptress, here positioning her and women at large as the true sinner. He can reclaim his masculinity through the virtues of chivalry. He wasn't being domed, he was actually just resisting sinful temptation like a very manly man would. And it works. Gawain is accepted back into Arthur's court as a hero, despite still wearing the green girdle, an obvious symbol for sexual intimacy, and also a women's clothing item. Then again, they can't know exactly how he got it. He could say anything. And the bedroom scenes in the story carry even deeper weight as well as a reflection of the medieval anxiety between heterosexuality as a social center point and the innate homosociality and homoeroticism of everyday life. As David Lorenzo Boyd writes, For if Gawain yields to his desires for the woman, taking her in effect, he will also be bound to yield his winnings to Bertilak, to submit to him sexually. In other words, his heterosexual role with a woman would also necessitate a passive homosexual one with a man, and the explicitly heterosexual act would necessarily, always already, carry a homosexual valence. His heterosexual desires are thus positioned to be intimately bound up with potential homosexual activity, the homosexual here being directly connected to his homosocial and chivalric relationship and oath to Bertilak. Ironically, then, it's a lack of homosexual desire that controls or 
prescribes the physical consummation of heterosexual desire. But on the other hand, the text itself doesn't actually betray the specific reason for Gawain refusing the lady's advances. It's more heavily implied that it's due to his chivalry and a conflict of knightly virtues. He does observe her as attractive and very beautiful. On the other hand, the text also heavily implies attraction between Lord Bertilak and Gawain in its wording. The way Gawain observes the Lord and the Lady are not all that different, and the ways he physically interacts with them are similar, though Lord Bertilak very distinctly bonds more poignantly with Gawain, especially his being the Green Knight himself, the very opposite force upon whom Gawain is in battle with. This is not Gawain's only instance of being used as a tool for exploring medieval queerness either. In the Lancelot prose, Gawain is quoted as saying, If God were to grant me my health, I'd immediately wish to be the most beautiful maiden in the world, happy and healthy, on condition that he would love me above all others, all his life and mine. Speaking of Lancelot, specifically. And this isn't really exclusive to Gawain, either. A lot of Arthurian tales and characters are kind of rolling in queer subtext, or honestly, overtext, because medieval writers were a lot less afraid of playing around with these subjects than you'd think. As Anna Klasowska Roberts says in Queer Love in the Middle Ages, medieval writers actively exploit the security and the prestige of the classical and Ossetan tradition provides them to explore the themes of same-sex preference and homoeroticism. Whether bundled with moral condemnation or discredited in relation to narrative truth, so vague as to be frequently dismissed or omitted in the interpretation of allegorical love scripts, or flirting with homoeroticism by heavily borrowing from the arsenal of heterosexual romance, perfect friendship narratives, same-sex preference seems rather a pervasive interest. It is smuggled into canonical works in recognizable ways. When Sir Gawain and the Green Knight was written, an accusation of sodomy was seriously a big deal. Even even though most of the time it just land you with a fine or a penance. It could ruin you socially in many cases. This is absolutely something the Gawain poet would have been aware of when writing the poem, but whether the poem is trying to directly reference anything is lost to time. But men kissing each other in and of itself could mean a multitude of things in the era. As Dorian Zwart writes, these platonic medieval kisses represent conventional cultural practice informed by the rules of courtesy and hospitality. There's nothing problematic about men's kissing one another per se in the medieval romance context. One could argue thus that the kisses shared between between Gawain and Bertilak are platonic, but Richard E. Zikowitz elaborates on why they're not. Since the narrative leads us to believe that Gawain fully lives up to his oath to offer Bertilak whatever he wins during the day, the kisses he gives him are equal to those he receives from the lady. By dismissing the eroticism of the male-male kisses, one also dismisses the sexual valence of the lady's kisses. And those are obviously erotically coded. And the fact is, since Bertilak reveals at the end that he was behind it all, it's a clear admission that in some way he must desire Gawain, because he asked his wife to seduce Gawain very forwardly, and thus Gawain must give Bertilak whatever he does with her. Carolyn Dinshaw explains, We could imagine that Bertilak had more agency in this whole plot that he finally admits to Gawain, that sending his wife into Gawain was a way of bonding himself via the woman to the man. Just guys being dudes. Thank you for joining me for a foray into the world of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. I don't hate the movie, and there was a lot about it that I loved, but obviously a lot of issues with it too. The bizarre changes to the Bertilag Castle arc are obviously my biggest beef, and I think it's in part because now in 2021, there was such a ripe opportunity to really lean into the gayness of this story like no adaptation has before, so that was disappointing. But I still enjoyed a lot of it. Really, I did. So, a big thank you again to Blinkist for sponsoring this video. Remember to click the link in the description below to get unlimited access for a week before getting 25% off a full membership to Blinkist and get learning. And with that, wash thy hands, wear thy mask, and if you live in a wildfire zone, get your emergency packs together and know your local evacuation route. Stay safe.